Ratu. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, may peace, mercy, blessing of Allah be upon you. Good afternoon, everybody. Indonesian time. It's my pleasure to speak in this opportunity. Thanks to COVID-19 pandemic, so that we can have live meeting over the internet, no matter where we are. And then, dear colleagues, professor, lecturers, researchers, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the committee, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and welcome you to the International Conference of Geography and Disaster Management, ICGDM 2022. Moreover, I honorably welcome our keynote speaker, Prof. Joseph Patepiko Sri Sumantio from Japan, and then Prof. Marius Lamentowicz from Poland, Also, our invited speakers, Prof. Dr. Sanusi Adeyoyeken from Nigeria, as well as Prof. Nabalekwa Muhammad Buambede from Uganda, and also Dr. Aina Slotpata from the USA. Our conference theme is Geography for Sustainable Development and Prosperous Humanity. It is my hope that ICGDM 2022 would be able to achieve its objective. in providing an effective forum for academicians, researchers, practitioners to advancing knowledge, research, and technology for humanity. I believe that knowledge, research, technology are for all people, for minorities, people with disabilities, and for everyone. But no matter how much we can accomplish by ourselves, whether it is research or development, It is never sufficient in this world of knowledge. Therefore, the focal drive of this conference is to exchange ideas, and by participating in this exchange, I hope that all parties who may benefit from the conference can apply the knowledge and the insight from this conference in their area of expertise. And then it is pleasing to note that the agenda of this conference covers a wide range of interesting topics such as human nature interaction, human geography, remote sensing and GIS application for society, and also social aspect of disaster management. Last but not least, my deepest gratitude goes to the advisory board or genesing committee, scientific committee, institution, companies, and all volunteers who have directly and indirectly supported the success of this conference. My God bless us with good help to make this event successful and enjoyable. Thank you for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Hamim, for giving the uh, speech. The next speech will be delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Geography, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Surakarta, uh, for Dr. Junadi Tanishyors. Thank you, Pak Vidya. Is my voice fine? Clear. Clear, clear. Okay. Uh, Bismillah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rabbi Yisrael Sadri wa Sali Ampi wa Rungtatam Nisan Yafro Roli. All praise Allah. Salawat and salam di upon to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, <clears throat> our honorable speakers, Professor Dr. Nabalik Wa Mahmud Bambidi, who already uh, among us, with afternoon Prof. Bambidi, and honorable speaker, Professor Dr. Marius Lamentowicz from Adam Maswi, Uh, University Poznan uh, Poland and then uh, our speaker Professor Jesapa Tutuk Ismantio who already uh, gave presentation in the morning today uh, honorable, honorable speaker Professor Dr. Sanusi Adiyoyikin from Federal University of Delhi, Minna, Nigeria. Also, our, our honor, honorable speaker, 
Dr. Eddie Tri Hatmoko from Nanyang Technological University. And then our honorable speaker, Eddie, uh, sorry, Dr. Ainas Lepata from Chicago University. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, give uh, to say welcome to the International Conference of Geography and Disaster Management uh, ICGDM 2022. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, particip uh, participation in this uh, conference to give uh, talk as well as to send us your uh, papers. Uh, the International Conference of Geography and Disaster Management is actually part of International Summit on Science, Technology and Humanity, or ISET, that has been held since 2018. This is actually the fourth of uh, conference of, of uh, ICGTM. Uh, that is in this uh, year, uh, we deliver the same that is geography for sustainable development and prosperous humanity. This the conference is actually covers for scope scopes of uh, field including human nature interactions, human geography, human sen uh, remote sensing, and GIS application for society uh, social aspect of disaster management. And we have received more than, I think, uh, 60 papers that uh, the ac accepted papers will be published in Atlantis Press Conference, a proceeding that is indexed by uh, Web of Science. By the theme of conference, we do hope that we can contribute to the advancement of the field of geography, especially to reach the uh, sustainable development and, and prosperous communities as stated in the theme of the conference. Naturally, geography is actually linked uh, to the to, to sustainable development with its trans uh, interdisciplinary uh, perspective. A geographer understands that a human environment relationship is actually uh, needed in order to inform us to manage natural resource uh, to convince that we can do the uh, management in sustainable manner as well as well as to use resource properly and then to protect the planet from the degradation as well as from the impact of disaster. Also, through the human geography, geography help us to understand how the past societies and environments developed, which provides the context of the present and helps help us to plan for our future. Uh, <clears throat> so I think this conference is very useful and we hope, uh, we do hope that uh, the theme is very uh, useful to uh, make geography in, uh, important to our life. Finally, I wish this conference will be successful and again the goal. Thank you very much uh, for the time. Thank you for the community where uh, uh, we prepared everything for the conference and good luck. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Smoti, for giving uh, the speech. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, move on to our next agenda. Now we have come to our main agenda. Uh, this afternoon, we will be listening to a presentation from Professor Mariusz Lawentowicz, a professor of earth science at Adam Mickiewicz University at Poland. 
We are honored to have him today, and this session will be moderated by Mrs. Dewi Novita Sari, MSG. All right, before the presentation begins, uh, please allow me to introduce our moderator for today. Dewi Novita Sari, MSG, was graduated from Faculty of Geography, Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta. After that, she was awarded by a scholarship and completed her master program in Adam Mickiewicz University at Poland. Her master's thesis is about vegetation mapping and identification of dominant species in Zetin Pitland using geographic information system. She has been a member of European Geography Association and has experience of working with ASEAN Development Bank. She is now a full lecturer in Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta, and her research are mainly focused on the use of GIS and remote sensing for hydrology, vegetation, and also ecology. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Ibu Dewi Novitasari. Ibu Dewi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mbak Vidya. I have my uh, sound is clear. Yes, it is. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. For Romanius, and good afternoon for my distinguished honor. First of all, let us thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of his blessing, we are able to come here to join in this conference. My prayers and peace be always upon up Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa All right. Uh, our final session of the conference is about to begin. Thank you very much for preparing yourself to join our virtual conference. Respectable for our keynote speakers and invited speakers, the Honorable Lecturers of Faculty Geography, Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta, and the Honorable Participants of this virtual conference. The International Summit on Science, Technology, and Humanity, I said 2022, is organized by Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta, Indonesia. The summit aims to provide a platform for researchers and academics to share their research finding with others and make academia from other institutions or other country and to strengthen the collaboration and networking among us. Okay, first, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Dewi Novita Sari. You can call me Dewi, uh, the moderator of session today. I'm very happy to see you here and Welcome all of you to join the International Conference of Geography and Disaster Management, ICGDM, uh, 2022. Right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we start the presentation, I would like to read the sequence of the first conference session today. This seminar uh, is divided into two sessions, keynote speaker uh, today. Uh, the first is Professor Jesu Patri Tupo Sri Sumantyo, an MPhD from Center of Environmental Remote Sensing, Chiba University, Japan. But uh, Prof. Jesu Patri Tupo has concurrently as ESET speaker. So for this online session, we have Prof. Maria Slamentowicz. Prof. Maria Slamentowicz is from Kulimachi Ecology Research Unit, uh, Faculty of Geographical and Geological Science at the Miskewish University, Poznan, Poland. Now, uh, I will read one by one our agenda of this session. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping for participants. Yeah. Uh, the first is opening remark by moderator. Second, presentation time for Prof. Marius Lamentowicz. You have 45 minutes for presentation. And following next with discussion, answer, and question, uh, this session for around 15 minutes. And uh, also today's session is being recorded uh, to be available for viewing uh, post-conference on YouTube. If you have any question for the presenters, please use the raise hand feature in this Zoom. You can also submit a question via the chat feature for presenters uh, to answer after this session. All right. For those who are not speaker, please turn off your microphone as well so we can focus on the material. If you have any uh, technical problem or question, please reach out to me directly via the chat function. All right, so I would like to say hello from, from <laughs> Professor 
Dzień dobry, prof Marys. Dzień dobry. Uh, uh, I hope you can hear me. You can hear me well. Yeah, can we yeah? personally uh, hear you very well. Okay. It's been a long time. Uh, I haven't seen Prof. Marius. Maybe about four or five years. I'm very grateful and very excited today to meet again with uh, Prof. Marius. By the way, uh, Prof. Marius was my supervisor for my thesis and my project. <laughs> we had a project in Zetsin. Uh, this is the main place in West Poland or German boundary. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I, I could share my, sc my screen now. Thank you for the invitation and description of my work. And uh, I'm really delighted to be here for a while to tell you about peatlands uh, and my work, and not only my work, but uh, but partly. Uh, and so I will, I, I will share my screen now, okay? All right, uh, the floor is yours. Mm. Please let me know if it's visible. Yes, it's okay. Can, can you see the screen? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, let's go. I will just uh, make, oh, oh, once again. So this is my um, my pleasure to tell you to tell you about peatlands. Uh, I named the, the presentation. Uh, I I named the presentation uh, title uh, very wide, 
um, because the the problem of peatlands development and response to climate change is is really complex. That's why I wanted to make it. Uh, quite general for this purpose, for, for this meeting. Uh, at the background, uh, you can see the picture of one of the Siberian raised box um, nearly in the night. So it's uh, it, it looks quite a romantic picture, but it's also full of problems related to the global warming. Maybe at the beginning, because not everybody here, I guess, is working on peatlands, I would just tell shortly what peatland and peat is. Mm. So in case of the peat, the peat is in general the organic matter that used to be produced by plants and stored in the one place, a place of the origin, uh, in the hydrated situation, so in the high water table situation. And the peatland is the area that is related to the accumulation of the peat. So uh, it's quite simple, but it's not as simple when we go to the details. But in, in general, the peat is the organic matter that was accumulated in, in the place of the origin. So you can see also the, um, the, uh, the, the, the picture of example of the peat on the, on the left side of the, of the presentation. Uh, considering distribution of peatlands, they are mostly located in the north. Um, these are sphagnum dominated mires like Siberian bogs or, um, or Canada, but they are also occurring in the tropical regions. You can see one of the biggest peatlands in the world, tropical, one of the biggest, the Congo, in Congo, uh, also Amazonia and the Southern America, and also Indonesia and this area is full, is, 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 is plenty of many different peatlands peatland types as well. Uh, considering the um, surface, peatlands are covering 3% of the Earth's surface. So it's not, it seems not to be a lot, but they are, we should consider that they are deep as well. So I will tell you more about the, the carbon content in peatlands and, uh, and during the next slides. In Poland, they cover 4% of the area for the comparison. Um, so uh, it means 50,000 50, of peatlands. In the, in the picture, you can see the peat or accumulation potential of different peatlands in the world. Um, and in this kind of um, the resulting from one of the publications. So why peatlands are so important? Why are we working on them? They are they they preserve the local, uh, unique local biodiversity. Uh, the, the the organisms like birds, for example, you cannot see them in the other ecosystems. They are mostly in peatlands. The the same is relating to the plants. So they are remnants of the natural ecosystems, let's say primeval, uh, not touched, at least remnants in many parts of the world. And what is amazing, they preserve, they store information about the, the, the past, the past climate, past environmental changes and human impact. Oh, let's go further. Why they are so important in the global scale? Despite of the not very big surface, they cover one third of the of the carbon carbon stock or carbon content, organic co carbon content. They have they store ten percent of the fresh water. They are sponges that are holding the water very efficiently, and they store around um, uh, five hundred fifty gigatons of carbon. That is related to 30% of the carbon stored in the soil. So it's a huge amount of the carbon that is stored in peatlands. You can find different peatland types. In the tropical regions, there are different peatland types. In the northern part, you might see the peatlands like these, raised box. In Siberia, Canada, um, or Europe, Northern Europe, you will find this kind of of peatland related to sphagnum. Sphagnum is the ecosystem engineer that is 
covering lots of peatlands in the world, the biggest surfaces. This is just an example from Poland, Kusowo raised bog, and a really, really nice site. Another type of peatland is the fen. Fen is dominated by sedges and brown mosses. Fens are not very, let's say, spectacular for the first look, but for example, in Poland, they cover most of the surface of peatland area. And also, um, and also tropical, most of the tropical peatlands are rather fens uh, or forested peatlands. So the example of the fan looks like this. It's not very spectacular for the first look, but if you go into the ground, if you if you look through the vegetation, it, it stores. I mean, it, it has a lot of spectacular protected species. And now I would like to shortly to show you the overview of the land peatland landscapes in the world. Uh, it just it does a snapshot because there are a high variety of the different soils. When you go to the Alps, close to Sankt Moritz, for example, you f you might find the the the, the fan or a calcium bridge fan like this. When you go, for example, to Western Siberia, you can see this kind of landscape related to the permafrost uh, and frozen ground that is below these sphagnum-dominated areas. You can jump easily to Alaska. You might find this peatland, this kind of peatland that is dominated by sphagnum, but there are also fen, uh, fen, uh, fen mires that you can find there. Quite a lot of peatlands in Alaska are covered by the forest. You can jump to Tierra del Fuego, Argentina, and see a similar environment, but very different in terms of vegetation and also microbial world that we are also interested. These are just landscapes, but they are having a lot of information and a lot of hidden food webs inside the soil. You can also fly to Poland, and this is just an example from the northern Poland, cattle hole mires with a beautiful pool are surrounded by sphagnum vegetation and managed forest. So this is forest area, but managed 100% by human. Or you can jump to Tuhola Pine, the woods forest, to see this kind of fan, calcium rich fan. For the first look, it's also in this case, it's flat and maybe surrounded by forest, not very spectacular, but again, details are in the soil. Then when we want to, uh, let's say, to look at, the, at some peatlands from, from above, they, they look like uh, holes in the forest, but they, they also, covering a lot of interesting vegetation. This is the same site that just before from the picture that but seen from above, from, uh, from the plain. Other sites like nature reserves, this is example of the one nature reserve in, in Tuhola pine woods in northern Poland, is surrounded by wetlands and, uh, and peatlands as well. This is Taxus Bacata, very old stand that is located here that is that is exactly surrounded by peatlands a lot of nature reserves in the world and in poland uh, i guess also in indonesia are surrounded or covered covered by the peat so this is an amazing uh, an amazing uh, structure that is very often perceived as very rare and protected. You can find the rivers going through peatlands. This is the river Rhine peatland and also in Northern Poland. You can find the rivers like this in, the, in many parts of the world, but a lot of them were drained, unfortunately, destroyed, and sometimes completely destroyed. I will tell about destroy and disturbance later. Then you can see you can see that the, the situations like this with lakes and, and also rivers surrounded by the managed forest plantations, monocultures. You can see this the, here, this contrast between the managed ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem, I would say, and the 
something that is close to natural. In other situations like these, you can see even complexes of different peatlands. In one tree, you can see many different types of peatlands that are related to different trophic situations like oligotrophic raised bog, tree, um, uh, swamp with the forest, and uh, fen, calcium-rich fen. So one day when you come to Poland, I can I, I, I can point to this site. I mean, there, um, um, I, I, I would say this is one of the best sites that you can see in, in Poland, in northern, no, northwestern Poland. There are also kettle holes like these with the floating veg vegetation. You can see the floating islands that are moving around this small lake in northern Poland, also surrounded by the plantation. So the stories of each of these sites is quite complex. And uh, now when we look at them, they are looking so pristine, but they also have a, a quite interesting but complicated story related to human impact. That is probably the matter of the different lecture because uh, it I couldn't find time for that now. Some of the strongholds that you know, I'm sure, but uh, they are also surrounded by wetlands and peatlands like this Wielkopolska Gate stronghold from the medieval 1000 years old castle that is surrounded by wetlands. Also Poznań, at the beginning of the development, Poznań city was surrounded by wetlands that were drained, exploited, and now the city is spreading through, through that former area. You can go to North, South and Wales, uh, Australia, and you can see a lot of interesting sites. Australia has not a lot of peatlands, but in the mountains, you can find some of them. You can see a eucalyptus growing here, for example. And one of the examples from uh, Devi that uh, she sent me before the presentation from Papua, Indonesia. One of the examples, because Indonesia is full of a very amazing Amazing sites. This is just an one example, but you can find them in many places in, in, in your country as well. You can jump to Galapagos. You might be surprised, but in Galapagos, they are they are also peatlands. Even with sphagnum in craters, you can see small sites in those craters, but they were used from, from by our colleagues for reconstruction of the vegetation and climate change and climate change in the past. And um, ending this picture presentation and going to the another topics, uh, I would like to start to uh, to finish this slide, this um, picture presentation with the tropical peatland Peruvian Amazonia Amazon that was we were working on with some colleagues from 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 the UK in the past. So they are beautiful, but they have problems. I think about peatlands. They have lot of problems related to the drivers or agents of change, like temperature, permafrost towing, moisture change related to climate, also atmospheric pollution that we are working on also with some colleagues that are related to Anthropocene. I will tell shortly about Anthropocene, that it's a very developing idea, but still important for, the, for many ecosystems. Sea level change is affecting spread, I mean, the, the distribution of peatlands, land use change, like deforestation or afforestation, and also fire uh, that I'm going to focus in the, uh, in the next slides. So all of those changes are especially related, the, relating to the state of different sites are, are connected with the human impact especially during the last 70 years, 72 or 70 years. And some, some geologists are setting this border, boundary of the Anthropocene 70 years ago when, when um, great acceleration started. You can see 20,000 years scale here. And this is increasing human impact in this in this in this place quite recently but also very and also earlier 
uh, and uh, this is also Anthropocene. It's another topic, but um, uh, it, it's good also for the next, let's say, another presentation. It, it's strongly related with the state of the different ecosystems that peatlands are as well. So Anthropocene and this increase, in the, just coming back for a while, of CO2, and increase strong and sharp increase in, in methane and also increase in the in um, in um, uh, nitrous oxide that are main greenhouse gases are also related to land use changes not only emissions of uh, of carbon you can see the picture that is showing a lot i mean uh, that some sites in the world, at least most of them, are warming up to the human impact. And uh, one of the pictures that are, uh, are, uh, are actually shocking for me is this that is showing so big warm in the Siberia that, you, that we used to work in the past. Now we cannot. In the past, we used to work. You can see that Siberia and northern areas also here that war are warming up the most intensively. So you might ask, what's the consequence of this warming for, for the peatlands? And other wetlands, I'm sure we are observing in globally the shrinkage or disappearance of wetlands. Also, lakes are, uh, have a lower levels. Uh, and um, we were really curious uh, what happened and how, when it happened in the past. So this picture, for example, is showing the 2000 perspective of the water table or let's say hydrology of peatlands in Europe. And we realized, okay, it's not, it's not only last 50 or 70 years, just we used to think about, you know, that something has started to happen, let's say 100 years ago or so, but even hundreds of years ago, wetlands started to be drier and drier. That was related to the human impact. This picture is showing you that these are, continental peatlands but in the uh, in from Poland mostly but in Europe when you consider entire Europe uh, the water started to decrease in peatlands and also other wetlands uh, 200 years ago so what happens what's the consequence of this this decrease you can see that in this this picture this is the, the picture of Biebja River, uh, uh, the site, the national park located in eastern Poland. One of the biggest surface area, a surface of peatlands in, in Poland and one of the best preserved, usually wet. It was some years ago, it was burning. It was completely... Uh, it was burned, a big area was burned. And the, the pictures like these uh, uh, were quite common with the white stalk searching for the food uh, coming out from, from the fire. Uh, that was quite shocking for Polish people because uh, for fires of peatlands are not so common here. And this big area was burning. Fortunately, the peat didn't burn, just the, the vegetation that recovered. Afterward, by the way, some birds were very important birds who didn't come back to, to this site, at least not so fast. So Biebra River, but not only, maybe um, I'm sure you, you see, uh, we, everybody of us looking at through the media, especially during the summer, also during the winter, can see this kind of picture, Siberia is burning very very intensively since since decade especially it was burning in the past we used to reconstruct fires using the peat course but the, now the recent years are really striking in case of of this area that used to be usually wet so one of the effect of the of the global warming one of the effect of the Anthropocene. And in some situations, this is my picture from 2019, you can see that this site was burned completely to the ground. This is the mineral ground, sand mostly, and 
black black uh, this black area this is the remnant of the burned of the burned peatland so not only uh, land use change but also climate climate and global climate especially is change is changing the meteor or climatic situation in different parts of the world especially uh, also in in Siberia so you can see that this is the the just in picture very very uh, general picture showing the the current let's say or, or atmospheric circulation changing that was allowing the the taiga or um, also the the peatlands uh, uh, other wetlands to 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 to, to burn uh, in 2019 20 and 21 so it's this global situation, global circulation that is affected by uh, global warming is also affecting different ecosystems, uh, including Siberia. In the worst situation, we have something like we, what we name zombie fires. And the zombie fire, fires are, in this case, are fires that can appear in one place go below ground in one year and appear reappear in the in other place burning the pit and also burning the forest so this is something what is very difficult to to struggle with so again i would say oh it's it's surprising that re water related ecosystem is burning but it's possible it's possible when water tables or hydrology uh, is uh, really uh, changing towards drier and drier situation and some of my colleagues are working especially on the f on on these kind of fires sometimes in uh, from the pictures from yakutia for example you can see the the smoke that is coming out uh, from below below the snow because they are also burning in the winter in the case of Indonesia or other tropical regions, we can see a lot of change. I mean, deforestations and also drainage. This kind of drainage is affecting the soil moisture, especially when the water is uh, in shortage. You have deficits of the water table. And this kind of situation is leading to the fires very often in case of the areas that were drained for different purposes. Um, and uh, in these pictures, you can see the fires in uh, uh, our old palm plantations that are spreading uh, in the intertropical, different tropical uh, parts of, um, uh, um, of these kind of sites. So it's very uh, bad, I would say, it's very bad for the different ecosystems, this kind of ecosystems, and not, not only peatlands around, but also really harmful for people because the toxic haze that is coming out, so you can see this PM 2.5 indicator of the toxic haze that was described in this publication, very recent, 2022, that is that was made on the basis of the GIS analysis of of the of the of different databases is showing the spread of the toxic haze. We have the same, I mean, similar situation during the winter in Poland. Poznań, for example, is, consists this kind of um, um, of of the substance in the in the air uh, in the air, especially during the winter when people are burning the coal. So not only in Indonesia, but also Pananta, Brazil. Uh, Pananto means swamp. Swamp is wet. Swamps are burning. They used to burn, of course, not constantly, but they used to burn in the past. So uh, you can also think, I mean, you can also think how to, how wet, wet areas can burn. Also Amazon, these are, this is the picture uh, from several years ago, I guess. They are, you can see the dots of fires here. Uh, of course, most of the fires are anthropogenic, so triggered by human, but they are also occurring in the wet sites. Amazon is full, is, is, um, is really abundant in peatlands that are covered under the forest. 
So why this happens? I mean, how how can we? This is the next question. How how can we protect those sites? This is the the big question and the global uh, and we need global answers. But uh, I mean, warming up of the atmosphere is coming mostly from this substance that used to be the pit in the past, the coal. Coal was the pit in the past, millions of years ago. You can see the picture. Sorry, it's a, it's in Polish, but you can see the scale, uh, the millions of years. So this is the carboniferous where, um, where, where the coal, black coal was, was created by plants, also photosynthesis and uh, stored as a peat. Then we have the brown coal or lignite here. So this situation uh, in the past. And then we are extracting that we are extracting that and burn that this is the the one of the uh, one of the biggest cold coal um uh, coal um, energetic plants in poland that is based on lignite so this coal are warming peatlands are warming our world but we are using the former peatlands to warm up the world and this this cause also another uh, um, uh, response that is related to the pit burning uh, currently uh, nowadays. So we are really concerned and focused on different aspects of the peatland development. So uh, looking into the past, I'm just going to tell during the next slides, looking into the past and uh, um, and looking at what's going on now can give an important perspective for peatlands conservation. So we are focused also on peat exploitation and related global warming, especially drainage and climate change and related hydrological disturbances are also the focus of, of scientists in the global scale. And the consequence like peatland fires and consequence for the health, human health, are really important to be to be explored. So not only now in the current situation, but also past is very important to, 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 to know, to, to understand. So when you look at this kind of matter, this is the peat core, and I would say peatlands are Per, um, I would maybe not perfect, but important archives of the past past changes. Even in this course, you can see some some important information. But we need also proxies to we need to understand proxies, power indicators to um, to 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 read these changes using paleoecology and eco ecological approach. We are trying to reconstruct, for example, the past fires. Uh, this is the time scale that is showing different perspectives from the days to millennia and using different experiments, ecological experiments, we can combine them with monitoring and paleoecological reconstruction, quantitative reconstructions. Sometimes peatlands are bringing this kind of information very rare but important about human life in the past this is very famous tolund man 2500 years old from uh, from western europe uh, in poland we didn't find any bog body but there are even books uh, quite um, large books about bog bodies we are more focused on this micro information that was macro this is micro information about on biotic proxies. Myself, personally, I'm working on tested amoeba that Devi already mentioned. And uh, they are bringing important information about the past, in, uh, crucial information about the past hydrological change that can be related to human impact or climate change. Poland, like this, uh, this is just an example, is bringing information about the past vegetation change, like deforestations, charcoal, fires. This is the part of the charcoal. This is the fire in, uh, indicator or proxy. Plant macrofossils like those here can bring us the information about 
local vegetation change that is also quite important and quite famous recently non-pollen palinomorphs that are fungi remnants for example so fungi spores this is an example of the study from poland from northern poland covering six six uh, thousand five hundred years of the story of one one bog in the in, in, in pomerania and uh, of course, it's too much to speak in this short time. This is a separate topic, but you can see what we've done here. These are archaeological periods related to the wetness of the site, also to the fire, and um, related to the veget local vegetation change. You can see the forest structure changing here, strong human impact during the um, Bronze Age, and the fire events that were identified as in impact of the human. Most of the fires during 5,000 years, big fires uh, in the history of, of Poland landscape were related to, uh, to human impact. So this is the potential, example of the potential of this method. Using radiocarbon dating, you can obtain, we can obtain the reliable time scales for the reconstruction of the past changes. But this this was about the past, but we want we would like also to see the future. Just one picture before I shift into another topics. To to predict the future, we need experiments. This is the time machine. We are moving to, into the past, and now we are moving into the future. You can see open top chambers. These are green, let's say, uh, greenhouses, small open from the top, that are uh, let's say imitating. Uh, warming locally. This is one of the sites in Poland, Liniemeyer, that you, we used to have these open top chambers there 10 years, already 10 years. You can see this kind of structures also in tundra and also forests. So they are using to, they are used for the, the so called global warming experiments. Uh, so this is about this studies and the potential. I haven't said about uh, uh, about the monitoring. Uh, this is also another topic. Observation is also important. Uh, there's also big potential of GIS systems to to observe and um, and protect site, different sites. But also, the state of the site is very important. What does it mean? Healthy living peatland healthy living people healthy human can be healthy but also ecosystems can be healthy stable they're relatively stable um, so they they when they are healthy they have a water they also store efficiently the carbon carbon is uh, not this kind of carbon that i showed you i'm sure you know but uh, just explain carbon stored in the organic matter they are healthy from this point of view. Looking at the nice picture from Greifswald University from Germany, you can see that also from this picture that, that they're emitting not a lot of carbon dioxide. They have a nice vegetation, nice plants and birds, like this is uh, Acrocephalus paludicola, uh, endangered species in the in global scale. So uh, also butterflies, you can see great biodiversity. Uh, the healthy peatland raised bog looks like this in case of Polish conditions. You can see this side related to the vegetation, wet vegetation, uh, very nice sphagnum, ecosystem engineer, probably you, you remember, and nice microbes, tasted amoebae that are top predators in the micro scale. Uh, this kind of Chalosphenia papilio consists uh, consist of symbiotic algae inside. It's an indicator of the nice state of the hydrology of the site uh, or state healthy, healthy raised bog. Healthy, healthy fan uh, might look like this. This is one of the examples. Pseudocalier gontrifarium. This is the species that is growing in, in really nice alkaline fans. You can find that, for example, in the, in, in the Alps in some conditions um, in the uh, different parts of the world, but disappearing because of the increasing human impact. Disturbed peatlands, not healthy, 
sick, I would say. I'm a little sick, by the way, but well, my, my throat is not in good conditions, but I'm trying to manage. Uh, disturbed peatland is a source of greenhouse gases like methane or carbon dioxide or Mm, and the, and others. It's also the 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 source of the toxic toxic haze through the peat peat uh, fires. Those disturbances or these these sicknesses are related to the climate drainage. So uh, disturbing the vegetation and disturbing the the hydrology through the artificial drainage ditches are usually um, uh, created. Uh, uh, on peatland sites, mining, so peat extraction and afforestation. I should add also deforestation. In some cases, afforestation, I mean, it's nice for peatlands around, especially, but in the it coming out to the you know, to the afforestation of peatlands in Europe, it's really bad. But afforested, I mean, peatlands with the forest in Indonesia is something something uh, usual, something something appropriate. So it depends on the region, of course. So you can see the pictures like this, and I'm going to show you them also in a while. And uh, what we have in case of, uh, what's the situation with greenhouse gases on a drain peatland? Uh, especially the sites from glass grasslands are drained, drained peatlands. Uh, in Polish conditions or West European conditions. Uh, also, I mean, the crops with maize are also related to the peat and they can emit uh, uh, the flux of the carbon dioxide might be four, four um, tons from hectare of, uh, of CO2 uh, during the year. So it's it's a lot, 30, 40, it's it's a lot. This is the situation with the with the drained mire that is exploited for different purposes. So how they are looking, are they looking in the case of this kind of, of disturbance? Um, I used to work also recently with the local communities in in, in the cities in Poznan. Poznan also have peatlands, and we are discovering them. Some of them are destroyed or being destroyed. Also my town, this is example from my town when I'm living and the whole walking, uh, often walking with the dog around and I found the beetland destroyed like this with the ditches and the forest was completely removed. But it's not only this situation. When you go there another, to another site, not only cities, of course, agricultural sites uh, are looking like this. You can see the ditch that was cleaned. Uh, they are, I mean, different companies are paid for cleaning the ditches. They're removing the dirt outside to make the ditches, um, these, these channels, I would say, efficient to, to removing the water. This is just an example also from, from Eastern Poland, illegal illegal ditching was our channel was 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 dig there um, and it's very often not allowed people are doing that on private ground sometimes they are not allowed but doing and not conscious that is really bad for the biodiversity and climate so this is made for this in this case this is the grassland that is emitting 30 30 uh, tons of carbon dioxide during the year but it's not only grassland. These are also peat mines. In Poland, we don't have a lot of big peat mines, but they are quite common in some places. You can see the site where the peat was completely cut out. So there's only, when you look at this, or maybe here, when you look in this level, these are lake sediments, just maybe one meter or 30 centimeters left. And this peat is sold around the world especially from Estonia, Lithuania, and the uh, eastern part of Europe might be where peatlands are very much exploited. There are also some small mines like these, well, close to my town. Unfortunately, they were allowed to extract the peat for the mushroom production. So uh, there are different contexts of disturbance. The pe peatlands are disturbed uh, through the uh, drainage for for, for agriculture, for the afforestation, for the forestry, 
you know, there's a big story about the um, uh, afforestation of peatlands in Finland, for example, but also for the for the peat mining, as the peat is used uh, for the horticulture. We can you everybody of us can go to the supermarket and buy the peat. That is really bad in general for nature. Uh, Europe degraded um, European people degraded peatlands in high extent unfortunately and the, the state of the degradation you can see here the area and also the the percentage of the of the peatlands in the uh, in the area of, of of the country you can see that Germany Portuguese there are not a lot of sites here but still I mean Germany probably the most uh, destroy Kitland the most. Poland is not 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 okay in this case as well. We have a lot of things to be done, but this is uh, but another story, another uh, topic related to to peatlands is is also related to forests. We used to think about forest and peatlands, forest and wetlands as something different, separated. Not only it's not like this. I mean, we are just discovering links. And foresters in Poland are more and more focused to store the peatlands to, to preserve them because they are storing the water. And especially in case of the carbon, peatlands are more effective they can, um, in storing the carbon. Maybe they can store millions, carbon millions, thousands or millions of years. So they are more efficient. But peatlands and forests are closely related, especially, I think, Indonesian sites. Indonesian peatlands are very closely related to forest and wetlands ecosystems. And forests are growing what is surprising for some foresters in Poland when we have some, some courses or workshops. Forests are growing on the deep peat, sometimes 10 meters deep. An example is Białowieża primeval forest, one of the best preserved for, for forests in Europe, remnant of the pristine forest. And the foresters in general, naturalists, were, has, hasn't been aware that this kind of really precious forest was used to be related to wetland that was disturbed in the past and they are the, now starting just starting to struggle with the forest you know, forest um, uh, disturbance you can see the spruce here that was killed by bark beetle and also the the river not flowing so it's a problem something uh, something there is a problem so i'm going towards the end because time is um, uh, time is um, very close sorry i'm just several slides about conservation or restoration we have to do something then and when we have dry peatlands and we want to make them wet this is a nice picture in german in this case from greiswald more the nice group more, um, very interesting a group of people are walking on peatlands there where you can see the uh, situation with channels and drainage and uh, wet wet conditions so we can do something uh, for Siberian box, probably not so much, but um, I mean, in local sites, drain sites, we can make them wetter. And uh, this is an example from Poland, from one of Kusovo sites that I mentioned already, that is dumped by the, the, the ditch, the channel was dumped, was closed to store the water. In Latvia, you can see the situation like this. We used to cooperate with colleagues from Latvia where the former extracted site what was covered with the water and the pit starts to uh, accumulate again. In other situations, uh, uh, other um, solution is paludiculture. So production of the wetland plants for the economy, also for the, for the different purposes, for the composts, uh, except using that, except for the, pe uh, for the peats. So uh, it's developing well in Germany, and now also some, some people are working on that in Poland, using formerly destroyed soils, making them wetter and producing their organic matter to use this as a um, uh, economic value. So uh, this is an example of the cattail, typha, tifa, uh, tifa production. But for that, we have appropriate hydrology. I'm going towards the end. Uh, so this is, these are the just three sli slides, last three slides. Uh, 
About that, I could speak one hour, but uh, we don't have time. <laughs> so, a hydrological tipping point. Which water table is the best for the uh, healthy peatland? And where is the risk? Uh, my colleagues working on the peat fires in uh, Canada, uh, my, um, uh, they said that 40 centimeters is the, increasing the risk of the, of the, of the fire of the peat, 40%. Uh, we found 11, let's say 12, might be around 10 water table, ground water table, around 10 is typical for for the stable, nicely growing peatland. When it goes to 20, situation get worse, especially in long term. And especially maybe th this is the final picture, but also imp I think uh, uh, crucial, and significant in terms of the global warming potential. Global warming potential um, uh, is the lowest in the water table around 10. The uh, water table below the ground around 10 in, in, in at least sphagnum dominated, not only, but mostly sphagnum dominated systems. So it means when the hydrology is like this, not a lot of carbon dioxide no, and not a lot of, um, uh, of of methane is coming out to the atmosphere, warming the warming the um, the, the the climate. So, just summary. In my summary, I, I I would have just several general statements. Like, I want to re, uh, I mean uh, state again that they are important reservoirs of the fresh water. We sometimes we forget about that because water is, some, is often not visible on the surface. It's just slightly below, but they are sponges. So it's a lot of water below. Uh, we should restore hydrology that I showed, that I told you just in, <laughs> in for a moment by drumming ditches that is important for human health. It's, 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 it's um, restricting the fire when the water table is high. Uh, and peatland restoration is important for, this is nature-based solution, direct nature-based solution. That is quite common statement in terms of to, to protect climate, I mean, towards protect, protect climate. And the last slide tells about global warming. It, it, we are convinced that global warming is responsible for a lot of disturbance of different ecosystems, not only peatlands that increase carbon emission uh, and carbon in different forms, methane or carbon dioxide. And it's increasing the risk of fires, this kind of, this kind of uh, decreasing wetness. Um, yes, and we, again, we have to close ditches. I, I, this is what I'm often tell, talking about, the storage of the water and, and um, climate actions. We have to close the ditches and because drainage ditches are affecting climate, um, climate alone a lot um, that is comparable with the industry also. So, okay, that would be my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I was very general. Uh, I, oh, I hope uh, um, I hope uh, you understood my English and uh, uh, thanks again for the invitation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. I hope my voice is clear. All right. Yes, so, yes, yes, it's yeah, good. Okay. okay, thank you, uh, Marius, for the excellent presentation. Yeah, it's as well as always, yeah. <laughs> From Marius Lamentovich, always have a really good uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, for the participants, if you have a question, we have 15 minutes, around 15 minutes, yeah. Uh, please raise your hand. I will call you to ask the question. Or if you want to put your question, please um, using the chat feature in the Zoom. And don't forget to introduce yourself first. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, anyone? <laughs> so uh, maybe the first is from myself. <laughs> All right. So um, it's really amazing. And uh, there are any influences 
from the land use and land cover change around the world rapidly actually yeah as we discussed it before i, I still i still remember that scene and we mm -hmm. discussed it in through the whatsapp um now going to try uh then 2017 or 2018 uh is there any um significant change in the land during mm. this pandemic you know because mm. i'm going back to indonesia uh, in the, this pandemic we have mm -hmm. been through the difficult time is there any something uh, any uh, something which uh, can make uh, the pitland going to try or maybe going to uh, more wet yeah. is there any um, but Any in Zetin, things? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. in Zetin or in general, in general. Uh, in general, in general, oh. because I know it's from the Zetin. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm uh, recently I'm engaged with foresters. I mean, Polish foresters are covering a big area of Poland, and uh, they are more and more interested to store peatlands to to protect them because they are storing the water. So there are more and more projects that are uh, devoted to their restoration. Even mm -hmm. in case of the European Union, there, there is a restoration law that will appear in the future and we will be, it will be obligatory to store, I mean, to, to increase the wetlands, wet, uh, wetness of agricultural wetlands. So we will be responsible for that. Now it's not regulated by law. But um, I think it's important to, uh, to, to support also support farmers for the we mm -hmm. wetlands restoration. And it's coming, uh, it's come, it's very close is that this law will come. But so far, it was the activity of the non-governmental organizations, but also Polish you know, foresters uh, that are really uh, interested. And more and more sites are, uh, I would say, wetter and wetter but still not enough. I mean, uh, quite a lot of them are dis still destroyed and drained. Um, uh, this is also, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly in the, um, the reality of Indonesia, but we are, mm. there are some colleagues that are working. Uh, it would be nice to, to find a link because a lot of wetlands are drained in Poland. A lot of them are exploited and deforested in Indonesia. But this is our common uh, aim to store the carbon, to store, to protect the climate and protect people also, also in th those two countries. That's why next year, this is what I told to, uh, we, we were talking about that with Devi, we will meet in different hubs meeting groups in Indonesia, Poland, and Northern America to talk about the carbon from peatlands, about the, about the restoration potential and the carbon accumulation, uh, carbon accumulation protection. Because what we are doing, uh, thank you, Devi, for this question, because what we are doing, we are, uh, we are not only protecting biodiversity, we are protecting carbon. Yeah. So it means... Drainage ditch blocked, each blocked drainage ditch is a nature-based solution for the climate. This is the climate action. And when, when it's done locally, in, um, when accumulated, this is a big impact on climate. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's progressing. Um, it's progressing, and I hope in the future there will be more restored sites uh, and um, in Poland, in Europe, and in the world in general. Okay, okay, thank you, Prof. I think we have uh, Prof. Wambede would like to ask the question for Prof. Marius. Okay, thank you, Prof. Wambede. You raise hand. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I thank uh, the professor for taking us uh, through that journey. It has been a very impressive one. 
But uh, to cut the story short, my concern is that these peatlands are a resource, a resource that uh, cannot be left without uh, uh, human utilization for now. And you have identified various uh, changes or land uses that are taking place in these wetlands. Of mm -hmm. these, of course, being a resource, we need to identify those that can be sustainably mm. implemented in the wetland. For example, if we change a wetland, I mean a peatland, to palm production, it is a crop, it is a vegetation. Will it have devastating impact than other uses? So we need to rank because human beings cannot watch resources when they are, because they should get out of poverty. So, of all those studies, which ones can we recommend for use in the pit line? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Wambiri. Please, mm -hmm. Maria. Okay, <laughs> just a short answer because time is going on. I guess you have a, uh, um, uh, you, 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 you might want to progress with the meeting, but you are right um, that. Uh, with peatlands are used, but peatlands very often are used without control. And the problem is that the peat is not uh, uh, recover. I mean, we cannot produce the peat easily, like uh, like the forest, the wood. We can produce the wood in the short time scale, like one hundred years or 50, 50 years. But the peat grows uh, of hundreds of years, so it means when we destroy the peatland we cannot come back to the former conditions very often. And I'm sure and people will use peatlands and maybe in some cases they, they, they should use because they have to survive, but it's not under control. It's not controlled. So um, losing a lot, we are losing a lot of tropical peatlands through the not controlled uh, devastation of sites. Uh, just uh, you know, and drainage and uh, and decrease in in in, um, in biodiversity. It relates also uh, to Southern America, for example. So uh, I think uh, yes, we should consider people, human there, but uh, really think uh, we should think sustainably how to make it sustainable. Is this possible? This is also the question for the discussion. Is this possible? to exploit peatlands, uh, peatlands sustainably. I hope we can have opportunity to discuss that in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is enough, Prof. Wambide? All right, anyone? Yeah, yes, thank you, thank you. We can move on, it's okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. But Fidya, do you have any question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marius, for the uh, great presentation. Uh, it's interesting uh, to uh, analyze the pitline area. My question is about Indonesia. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you know that uh, Indonesia will move uh, its capital to Borneo Island, to mm -hmm. Kalimantan, which is uh, originally is there are a lot of peatland area. So uh, in your perspective, in your uh, background, is it, uh, is it a good effort to move the capital to the uh, peatland area? I mean, in the perspective of sustainability of the, and also for the conservation of the peatland area itself. So what do you think about it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very, uh, I mean, it's very big question. Uh, uh, it's important question, of course. I'm, I'm, I have a pleasure to tell, to tell about that. But uh, also Polish, uh, let's say Poland had a, uh, had a um, 
uh, let's say, capital city surrounded by wetlands for a very long time ago. And uh, we had at that time, several hundred years ago, we had a different experience. Now we know what, what happens when we move, let's say, when we move, when we place a city uh, uh, in the biodiversity hotspot. It might be very harmful. Might be that there's a place that that is appropriate for that. I don't know exactly Borneo uh, area. Maybe there are places that will not be harmful to stay to place the city. But I guess exploitation of um, exploitation of nature will increase, and there will be a lot of drainage around, a lot of cutting and deforestation. And from my, if I can um, recommend, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make it considering so valuable uh, an environment especially when there are a lot of a lot of wetlands it might be not, it might be not no it might be not practical at the end i mean storing biodiversity might be very important for tourism for 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 different types of of economies not not only placing the city I wouldn't make it, but it depends on you. What are you doing? If there are a lot, I guess the biodiversity of Borneo is amazing and placing the big city there might be really harmful for nature, also harmful for climate. Okay, it's clear? Yeah, yeah it's clear. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, maybe one more question or if we still have uh, one minute. <laughs> okay. If you would like to ask the question via chat, please. Okay, Prof. Uh, maybe because the time is run out, uh, I would like to say thank you so much, Mario Slamentovic, a speaker for amazing presentation. Um, uh, Jingguya Barzo, Pan Professor Zadwan Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and also thank you for all the participants for a very attractive uh, participation in this seminar. Uh, I hope the seminar will be beneficial for everybody. So please give applause for the speaker and for you all. Yay. Tomorrow, we still have a day two for invited speaker and panel session of each track paper. So still keep in touch. Uh, Prof. Marius, Jisali Panhut Sepolicit do Indonesia, Popros to Prosh Kontas Zemenang. Tak? Tak, dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję. Have a good have a good evening then. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we still have a uh, uh, celebration, celebrated, appreciated uh, for you. So please uh, stay a moment. So mm -hmm. I'm Adewi Novita Sari as moderator. I'm also apologize for my mistake in delivering my speech, if any. Uh, see you tomorrow uh, on the fourth International Conference of Geography and Disaster Management, ICGDM 2022. Give back to you, uh, Master of Ceremony, Mbak Vidya, for the session today. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Dewi, for, the, for guiding us uh, in the presentation session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is the appreciation from the chair of ICGTM 2022. So uh, for Mr. Hamim, I'd like to invite Mr. Hamim to kindly deliver the appreciation to our speaker, Professor Marius, please. Thank you, Ms. Vidya, for giving me opportunity. Operator, Ms. Afifah, could you hear me? Okay, so this is just a symbolic appreciation from us to Prof. Marius for giving us insightful speech about Pitland. Hopefully, this is the beginning of our collaboration and hopefully we can have another collaboration, whether it is a research, conference, and etc. Thank you for giving the speech. Hopefully, we can have 
a better collaboration in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I also hope uh, we can do something in the future together. Uh, it would be great to see some sites, some pitlands in Indonesia and um, visit your beautiful country. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Bye -bye. I, we always yeah, keep we in look touch. Forward. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward to for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a productive and inspiring time together. And we finally come to the last agenda of this keynote presentation. I hope you found the presentation of this lecture is informative and helpful. So before we close this agenda, uh, let's have a photo session together. Uh, so for all participants, uh, please turn on your camera. Mbak Afifa, could you please uh, take the photo? Okay. Let us play. Uh, one, two, three. Satu slide lagi, dua slide. Sudah, video. Okay, thank you very much for Miss Afifa. Um, and the next agenda is the announcement from the conference chair. So uh, to the conference chair, time is yours. Thank you, Ms. Vijay, for giving me opportunity. Okay, for all of you, for the presenter, don't forget to join the conference tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. UTC plus 7 time zone, Jakarta time. And the schedule for your paper presentation will be announced shortly via email. That's all. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving us uh, the recent information. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, all participants, thank you to the all audience for your active participation. And on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank the speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Marius, for the valuable and informative lecture. Also, uh, I'd like to apologize for any inconvenience. And again, thank you for joining us today. And see you again in the next session. See you tomorrow. That's it. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, siapa yang motret tadi? Oh, maaf. Bye bye. Bye bye, Prof. Bye. bye. See you tomorrow, Prof. Ya, matur nuwun ya. Wes, matur Sami sami, Prof. Ya, monggo. Monggo.